I thought I would share with you a number, 92 in the periodic table. This is uranium. The sun really is an explosive thing with primarily hydrogen reacting with helium, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. We can think of hydrogen bombs and understand why the sun has been able to keep us so warm from a such a far distance for so long. But because we've got a powerhouse at the center of our solar system, our sun can even support the heavier elements like gold or uranium. With the element uranium named after the planet Uranus, the only planet named after Greek mythology for the god of the sky, its aqua blue hue matches the sky from its methane atmosphere. Fluctuating seasons from its 97 degree axis tilt, this potentially dangerous planet matches the metal element's danger to us here on Earth. So yeah, it makes sense that we use elements like uranium or hydrogen, elements the sun feeds off of to cause so much destruction so close to home. From hydrogen bombs to the U.S. and the USSR and third world countries looking for uranium for nuclear bombs, even to depleted uranium for as, you mili as military ammunition in high density penetrators, we'll look for ways to kill each other with the elements at our disposal. Wondering why our planet has suffered mass extinctions every 26 million years or so, with upwards of five extinctions in this planet's history, from dinosaurs to reptiles to 96% of marine life to the max extinction on this event, scientists can only guess that comets traveling through space cause these mass extinctions, but no one knows for sure. But some scientists theorize that if comets have a long orbit, orbits, hundreds of years, that a twin star to our sun may have an orbit even more immense. Imagine our sun actually having an undetected companion star in a highly elliptical orbit. <laughs> They've called this as of yet undetected red dwarf nemesis and it would be our nemesis with an orbit so large it would periodically send comets from the Earth cloud into the inner solar system, say, every 26 million years. And it's funny to think that if this were th true, this Death Star theory, our nemesis, this red dwarf star would travel through space but still be so undetectable to us that it wouldn't even have the energy to hold on to those heavy elements like uranium. And even if this nemesis was a brown dwarf star, it would still even be too low in mass, even sustain hydrogen fusion. But still, with just the right orbit, it could still send smaller comet soldiers our way to let their little infantrymen help do us in. So, as I said before, we'll keep pointing our telescopes to the night sky, trying to keep ourselves safe beyond our global borders, while we use these same elements, like uranium, so we can threaten each other out of existence in our own little skirmishes right here on Earth. Thank you. I know, long but weird, that's what I go on my astronomy kick stuff. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very, very much, I think. And I'm looking at my two Bob Knight, and one is staring at notes, and one is looking at me intently, and I think, oh, no, he looks away. I think I might have to give up Mr. Bob Lawrence. Please, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Mr. Bob Lawrence. Come on. I have a few poems. <laughs> First one is fights, gun battles, explosions, and chases. <clears throat> fights, gun battles, explosions, and chases. That's what the public wants. Ritualized, visceral violence with a dash of gratuitous sex. Okay, I'll give you what you want. Detective Square Jaw, 
of square jaw and lodestone, private investigators, calls in Suzette Hourglass, Gal Friday, more curves than a mountain run, road to his office. Cigarette, he asks. You're not supposed to smoke in the workplace, she reminds him. This is my office, he says. I'll do what I want in my office. Your office is part of the workplace. Tough shit. <laughs> Square jaw draws hard on his cigarette. The lamplight falling on his chiseled features casts noir shadows onto his face. The cigarette tip glows bright red, then explodes. A white blazing fireball severs Square jaw's head from his body and splatters gloop with detective brain around the office. That wasn't an ordinary cigarette, says Lodestone, surveying the scene. <laughs> no shit, Sherlock, says Suzette, <laughs> flicking ash and gloop off her clothing. I told him to quit smoking, says Lodestone. It's a bad habit, says Suzette, peeling off her messy dress. What are you doing, asks Lodestone, freeing myself from square jaws blood and bits of brain. Take it all off, says Lodestone. We've got five minutes before the cops arrive. Meet you in my office. Hello, 9-11? Mm -hmm. Suzette Hourglass smiles, swipes her tongue across her top lip. The camera zooms in on her cleavage. Fade. That's the ah. <laughs> Got to get rid of my retainers there. All right. Bob's heard this woman. I don't think most of you have. Three mad poets. Mad poet number one. There are poems here, seething in the pipes, the wall, the floor. The house listens to our every word, observes our every action, and codes our lives into poetry. I must liberate the entombed language. He clawed at the drywall with an ax, at the hardwood floor with a shovel. When the medics took him away, his hands were bloody, raw, and covered with unpoetic dust. Mad poet number two. Have I seen Valerie, the young secretary with the moon sweet face? Let me tell you what happened. She kept getting fatter and fatter, despite perpetual promises to diet. One day I saw her smoking in her car. I pleaded with her to quit. She did, and became so round, she floated out the window, over the trees, and into the sky, never to be seen again. I must be more circumspect in offering advice. The police brought him into the station for further questioning. <laughs> Mad poet number three. My wife wobbles like an orc. My house leaks like a sieve. When I walk through the back door, I smell something dead, but I cannot locate the corpse. The backyard where I planted grass is barren. My neighbors wish that I were buried beneath the naked soil. I crave return to my dreams even though in dreamland I received an F for a course I didn't withdraw from in time. My wife finds another lover when I am away and abandons me. The searing light of the bomb shines through my hands and my eyelids, all this over and over and over and over and over and over again. But my dreams are more serene than everyday life. A boundless tunnel without a wisp of light, a tunnel where every waking moment is a birth trauma. This poet walks among us, undisturbed, as if he were as sane as you or I. And my third and last poem, The Gift. At a recent reading, I learned that my body is a gift from God. A gift can be exchanged, right? Here I come, returns window. Don't try hiding from me, because if you're there, I will find you. I have had this body long enough. I'm putting in for the six-foot-tall Adonis model. I'm tired of looking up at the rest of the adult world. I'm tired of thin, weak bones. I'm tired of having my teeth drilled. I'm tired of seeing my hair turn gray and disappear. I want a strong nose, a strong chin, a face that makes women swoon instead of snicker and turn away. I want a deep, resonant voice. No more Woody Allen through a cheese grater. What kind of gift is programmed to self-destruct? Why not a gift where the skin stays smooth, the kidneys and lungs don't shut down, the brain doesn't morph into rice pudding? You think I'm a whimpering ingrate, 
petulant, selfish, waging satanic rebellion against divine wisdom. No. Were I created in the image of an immutable, timeless being, I would have a legitimate claim to a body everlasting. But I was fashioned out of star stuff, the oceans, the land, the air, the energy, the primordial Big Bang. Nothing in the universe, not even the universe itself, circumvents the second law of thermodynamics. We all die. And when there is no one left to imagine God, God will die. My body is not a gift. But it is suitable material for a tragic comic rant, for a fleeting moment of entertainment for an appreciative, perhaps contrary, audience in this strange, strange well we call life. You know, it's old, but this is from Linda Webb Aceto, and this is a short one called Too Freakin' Real. <sighs> is that what mania is? Fallout, endless bump and grinding night, while the brackish red claws of the harpsies spin me their spin me their film of spiderweb fright. Is that what it is? An impenetrable hole in my senses, surrounded by the clashing, blasting, raging white light commanding my spine keeps me twisted and pale. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. A few poems, so please, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Mr. John Yatko. Give it up for John. Come on up here. What's that? Make yourself comfortable. I am going to make myself comfortable, you know, because I don't usually come up here and read. And I've got this name to try to pronounce that is kind of going to be kind of tough. This is a poem called Less of Who I Am. What? I should be doing this in a different order. At least something or other. Yeah, you should do that. I'll start off with this one. Less of Who I Am by Luis Berriazabal, I believe is how you pronounce his last name. Less of who I am is apparent day by day. Perhaps life is a bore and I want to be alone. I want to shut the door and open a window. The air can come in. No one else is invited. I feel safe in here. Perhaps life can be less boring one day. I stopped caring about things. I will let idleness and silence take hold. And I'm going to read something off of this. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I'm actually going to read something that I wrote. All right. Believe it or not. You wrote something. Believe it or not. Yeah, I actually wrote something years and years and years ago. But I have, you know, I'm, I'm a very prolific writer here, you know. So you, you've probably heard this before, Bob and Bob. But I don't know if anybody else has. Is that right? Huh? It's called I Speak with Borrowed Words. That yes, you have. Like a calendar and like old yes. I speak with borrowed words. I'd like to think that these words were mine, these words of individual rights, of logic and reason, but I know they are not mine. I speak with borrowed words. I haven't had time for my own with the job, house, school. You know how it is. Life just seems to take time away. If you ever hear me speak with wisdom, remember, I speak with borrowed words because I haven't any of my own. <laughs> or I borrowed them from somebody else. You never know. Like this one here. This one, I guess you could say would be borrowed words. This is a found poem. Found poem from a mom in New Jersey. How is it that my daughter can fall out of bed, land two feet below on a hardwood floor, yet only awaken when I slowly pick her up? and place her ever so gently back in bed. <laughs> da, da, da. And one of them from it is a piece by Christopher Miller called A Crust Match. Oh, yeah. 
Nick receives a message on elove.com from a woman he'd been admiring ever since he logged on. And he and the woman arrange a meeting at Nico is a popular Japanese restaurant. Nick buys some roses. He sees the pretty woman crossing the street in the distance to meet him. Then the woman gets splattered apart by a truck. Nick lays down the roses he bought at her grave. I know, crazy ideas here. That's right. It's named, it is named after the one and only Waiting for the Bus Collaboratives Monday night and second Sunday readings at respectively Jack's Tap, Sangamon and Jackson in Chicago in the West Loop, and second Sunday at Powell's, formerly Barbara's bookstore, uh, just south of Halstead on Roosevelt Road. Very convenient access to public transportation, although there is street parking within a few blocks of there on the second Sunday of every month. I'm sorry I missed it this month. They had Mars Calton, Gregorio Gomez, uh, Tom Curry, and um, did you go, Bob? You weren't at that one either, yeah. I forgot who the other one was, but it was a good lineup. It was a really good lineup. Oh, Sarah Carson. I knew everybody's last name started with a C except Gregorio. Anyway. So do you want to hear Bomb Poem, Street Play, Last Dream for Paul, John Hartford Tribute? Or, or Mike's World. Bomb poem. All right. <clears throat> Waiting for the bus, bomb poem, and then Daniel Higgs. It's running late, of course. Four riders wait, quite bored. Above, clouds vie for dominion. A car zooms by on some kind of mission. Labra... Labradoodle pauses to check us out. His master offers a morning nod, and still no bus on the horizon. Ever our hopes continue rising. More time to wait, to wonder, to think. Frame your ideas so minutes can slip. iPod girl picks at a splinter. We can't stop time, but some of us linger. Below, a beer bottle disturbs the peace. Somebody's weekend was lively and free. And still no bus on the horizon. Ever our hopes continue rising. Thank you. Thank you. This is Bomb Poem from the Poetry Bomb, April 2011. Um, inspired by A.E. Hausman's Here Dead We Lie. Here, slightly dizzy, I stood on an unseasonably warm April day because I chose to belt belly up my shame and spring forth the images poets bring. Life in Chicago has none too much to give, but behold the carefree youth of today. They spill no drop of time for petty thought as this, and I was a teenager once, but with closed fist. Thanks. Now for some Daniel Higgs from the Outlaw Bible of American Poetry. This is from what I have learned about boxing. Excuse me a minute, I'm taking off my glasses so I can see better. What I have learned about boxing, the curtain rips aside, the one-way mirror clears up to expose you in posture short of dignity to prove you gave in to yourself finally because you're nothing without trials. According to your school of navigation, I said, I fear no pictures. It sounded like a battle cry when the delusion barreled down, eating hailstones like birdseed. What are we without trials? Spit to polish the shoe train, a stolen branch for the Easter procession, a predetermined turbine hidden in your liver clod. Bison and antelope and game shows and water towers and gang language, the simple instruments of little or no impact, I toil at their consoles, lever, jerk, and goof. I strike matches and herald mailmen, wait for you to come around, like you might guess you ought to, hoarding your numbers, coming of ageless eye glaze, searching for a mouth to trust along its natural border. Each whisker stores a breath with its name, 
Her face was a stable downtown bucket out a grid like bleachers or pews or orchards or infantry. We're always fit to spar. This is where we live sometimes on her face, the miser behind the headstone, the strategic lie that humiliates devotion for gut cosmic laughter, the twisting heels that deliver citations, buckets of foundry dope sloshing. When the money runs out, we sleep with the statues of heroes we mock. This is where we live a lot of the time, as close to her face as we can afford. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so I'm going to be reading different periodic table poems, I swear. So this is a really short one that I've never read here before. This one is number 28 in the periodic table. This is Nickel. Nickel for your thoughts, he said to me. So I had to ask, a nickel? Why? Because a penny is undervalued? <laughs> and he said, maybe it's because your thoughts are worth so much more than a penny. <laughs> and I thought, great, five times more. But still, it's only a nickel. <laughs> Besides, a nickel is only about 25% nickel in the first place. But then again, even though it's three-fourths copper, the cost of the metals is worth more than the metal. So maybe I should take him up on his nickel offer. Then I could say my thoughts are worth something. Thank you. Sure and free. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, from uh, my fourth book, Tiny Book of Prayers. We came here for water, we were served wine. We came here for bread, we were served a bouquet, a banquet of plenty. We came here with anger, we were shown love. We came here with guilt, we were given forgiveness. Yet in spite of all we were given, in spite of all we received, we still take our gifts for granted. Still, we ask for more. Still, we can't find it in our hearts to love. Dry, dry oasis, the truth is held within. The moisture is held within satisfaction. Dry oasis, the illusion of truth. Our parched lips longing for the vision before us, pushed toward the hope for water, the hope for cleansing. Truth, show your face. Truth, be my skin. Truth, be my divining wand, pointing to the path home. Truth, come to me in divine revelation. Truth, sweep away the shadows which crowd life's radiant joy. Truth, be the answer to all my questions. Truth, hide and seek be over. Ready or not, here I come. Sitting, and I read, and I read these words in bold font, announcing an end to permanence. Touch the pages, paper messengers with no gain in destruction. But I hold, but I hold fast and tight the idea of permanence. from uh, Pain of Love and Loneliness, my third book. What shall it be? I saw you. I saw you. I was dreaming, but still I saw you dimpled cheeks smiling, and eyes glazed with innocence, inviting a kind word. I saw you in passing with a nod and polite words. We passed, and you saw me 
Did you notice my desire? Could you smell my romance? Was it present at all? And you saw me, or did you notice? Did the polite words pass through the inviting gesture to some void beyond compassion? Was it compassion I was seeking after all? I saw you. I must have been dreaming. Will we ever dance like that again? She regrets her love's distance, the prick of the thorn, the blood, paper boat sailing away on winds she blew. She regrets hard shoves on shoulders, open hand on still cheek, clenched fingers on nose, winds of storms blown through life's choices. She regrets her love's distance, the path chosen taken away. I can keep the pictures hidden deep in my mind's eye where bridges lay awaiting the flame. I can keep to my side of the fence and not look through the boards, ignoring the pull of greener grass. I can dull the blade of expression, displaying a neutral face devoid of familiar comforting smiles. But I cannot remove the emotion from the core of my bones will seep the eternal pain of love. I can deny the desire to touch, lay soft fingers on inviting, cool skin. I can disregard the call of sweet pheromone aroma presenting delicious flavors. I can look the other way when beauty's temptation manifests in bare bellies before me, but I cannot remove the emotion. From the core of my bones will seep the eternal pain of love. So from uh, pull tabs and other things to stick your fingers through. There can be a picture in your, a picture of, there can be a feeling transcendent within that picture. There can be, there can, there. There can be a box there before you where you've placed with care the things you hold dear, the things you held, things that gathered dust, that gathered memories, gathered experience. There, in a box, on the floor, in the middle of the room, where your heart was broken, where patience was set aside, where you drew an alliance with anger, where a low tide of love gave way to the growing shore of discontent, where boundaries were tested and limits were crossed. There, now, sits a box, cardboard, holes for handles, sealed for transport, ready to move into tomorrow. There can be a voice heard behind your ears, very quiet, whispering. It is there now, calling you home, questioning your fears. You choose not to listen, choosing instead the influence of noise. There can be a time when all questions receive answers, all paths made clear. Listen, it is here now. Relax and seek the distant whisper. Question always, fear not the answers. Become yourself through truth. Daffodils painted, framed, hung on a wall, yellow in darkness with silent visitations by passing headlights. Invisible, yet still, beauty presented itself to a silent crowd of one. It was here that you appeared 
Again, a vision of beauty, a daffodil. So gently hanging. The folds wrapped in length, entwined, tightly knotted, slipped so gently around. The height, the clearance, the knot, secure, flying, freedom at last. St. Vitus dance, the breath, the end. Happiness, water, and a raindrop falling filling my imagination with a world of memory, a universe of smiles, cast in front of unspeakable secrets, shining moon pearl eyes staring into adventures never known, happiness, silver shining dewdrop, poised on the needle of a cactus in a dry desert at morning, just after the birds stop singing their welcome sunshine song just before the air is hot when thirst is all that's on your mind. Together we. The night will never come between us. Our souls transcend the reality of our existence. We shall remain together for as long as we wish. Daisies. Twisting, turning, entangled strands and mast crammed into a glass. Sunshine surrounded by white extensions of life. Reaching out for light, for life. Buds and blooms fading daily to their death. Daisies. I'll come home someday. This passion pulls. I am weak from sorrow. This passion steals. I am exhausted from breathing. No, mother, do not weep. I'm a good boy now. I know that love you once told me about. Your face was pale. They put blood into your arm. You smiled to touch my face. I understood then that I would understand now. It is all I really understand. It is all I really know to be true. I tried to run away, but I only ran closer. Your hand was cold. No one likes sadness. That's why you smiled. They put blood into your arm. The sun was shining through your window. It made an iridescent glow around you. Many people were sad, but you smiled. Memo. Nipuetsni, only joy remains after sorrow. It has come to this, a change of seasons. It has wondering where the next. It has come to footfalls in unknown directions. This time when one must decide to decide. It has come to this day to day creeping petty pace of tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Come to this, getting off the boat, going all the way, ready to face all the tigers in the jungle, to face the night's bitter cold, the day's vanquishing sun, ready to walk face exposed to the rain, accept moisture as a gift. It has come to this place where this voice within receives attention. It speaks now to come to where you've been, where you're going. It has come to this, a change of seasons. Safe. If it were coming, would you know it? Walking in the woods, leaves crunch under footfalls, the smell, the smell crisp air fills lungs, her hair, the scent of autumn. She is in your arms, so small, so small. Tears abate, your shoulder now damp. Simple, the events of life. Difficult, 
the events of life. You are her everything. She is in your arms now, safe. Her hair smells of freedom. This is freedom, you think. As she holds you close, tears abate. Your shoulder dirty with snot. Leaves, the scent of leaves in her hair. I love you. I love you too, Daddy. From my uh, eighth book, Screws Fall Out. And that last one will be from my ninth book when I get around to it. Actually, I have a it's misplaced somewhere when I find my round to it again. The perfect poem. What is the perfect poem? What does it take to give one the feeling, the emotion? Is it formed of love, love lost or gained, beating hearts or bleeding hearts? What forms the perfect poem? Anger of political disposition? ranting and raving against the system, against the world and the state of your social status, spreading the hate you bemoan. How does one craft the perfect poem? Through clever witticisms, tongue-dripping imagery, humorous jibs and jeers, setting oneself up on a plateau while pushing others deep in the valley below, or begging for the sympathetic savior to your self-deprivation. Does the perfect poem make us cry, make us laugh? Does it bring us to a place of empathy, a collective spiritual rendezvous in the ether of our hidden universe, and hold us there until we are all one? No. The perfect poem is born out of each of us when we conceive the idea, the thought, the emotion, and wrap words around that birth, then spew it out on paper or through voice in any language. Yes, the perfect poem lives within each of us. It is perfect in the nature of its being alone. And we are blessed by the experience of one sharing their perfection with us. Let us bow our heads, close our eyes, and embrace all who share their perfect poem. What is it with love? What is it with love, the touch, fingers on skin, lips gently joined, the flame of emotional surrender, the waking and naked happiness? What is it with love, the ability to endure bad breath, personality conflicts, folding daily drivel into mutual admiration? What is it with love that drives us, that pilots the course? across rough seas, knowing in our soul the storm will subside and bring us to a calm shore. This thing, this emotion, this beast that dines on our force of life, controlling our future, setting our past in sandy foundations, yet we long for its touch, its promise of euphoria, giving way to reason. We surrender to the moment to a belief in a comfort of an embracing womb. It pulls us in and we accept. Let it flow through you. Cast aside the fear. Cherish the moment. These poems. These poems I give you, words, expressions, emotions, feelings, they are free and can be dismissed but they will exist nonetheless. Take them, leave them, they are yours. Your lips. For you, I wash my hands, I wash my face, rinse my mouth, remove the stench of my catharsis. Your lips are the reward, our embrace, shelters the cold of my bones. It is worth it because you don't request it.
What were we? What were we then in the spring of our love? Bright flowers open to the sun's glory, folding our petals tight together in the night's chill and embrace opening to each morning. Were we but leaves fresh and new growing through our summer, stretching out our points to grab what light, what life, what energy we could hold in our cells, feeding the roots we had set deep within fertile soil, giving rise to seeds that would grow into their own trees, sprout their own leaves. Our fine greenery, our beautiful blooms, set out only to flame and final color, then wilt and shrivel torn from our trunk, cast adrift in autumn winds, our dormant winters holding the cold of our past droughts and tight rings, waiting for a spring rain that did not come, our growth stunted by life's misdirection. Lumberjack lawyers come now with sharpened axes, ready to hack what remains. We fall to the saw, milled to the plank, set in the kiln, our moisture removed. We are hardened, ready to be something new. <laughs>